friends of the pod. You're listening to Nobody Asked Us with Des and Kara, presented by TCS. Thanks for joining nice. us today. Yeah. What do you think about that? That, that was, was good. good. That was friends that was really of the good. pod. That was new. Um, I got versatile with adding the names back in in case people forgot who we are. I'm yeah. Des Linden with my co-host, Kara Goucher. How are you that doing? good. How are you doing, Kara? I'm good. I like that you added our names back in because we don't want people to forget who we are. Just play around with it, see what sticks. <laughs> but I like the less wordy version is also nice. Yeah, um, that's good. So though. I noticed you have a new backdrop this week. If you're on YouTube, you can check that out. It's very green. It looks this very is... not cabiny, but it looks like earthy. Oh, Where are you well, at? We're, we're in we're in a cabin. Okay. I'm in Minnesota at our cabin. It's small. This is the only room with a door. Basically, okay. this is our office hangout space, pool table space. Oh, nice. And then there's like a great room and then there's bedrooms. And this is where I will be all summer. But if you're in Minnesota, you should really just be outside anyways, like this time of year. That's true. That's true. Well, we haven't dropped the boat in yet. So we got to be careful when you do that. I'm actually (laughs) terrified after what happened to you. Um, we unpacked Tuesday yesterday. We had to go get groceries and stuff and do all that kind of stuff. And so yesterday Adam was mowing the property, you know, because it's ticks season. So he was mowing the property and getting all that kind of stuff ready. And then tonight we're going to drop our dock in and we'll probably put the boat in tomorrow. But I am like legit terrified after you almost losing your thumb. No, just um, no loops in the lines. Oh, yes. loops, just take them off. Okay. I'm not. I'm just going to let go. and be like, <laughs> the boat can get crashed. I don't <laughs> care. I'm not losing my hand. Smarter decision. <laughs> I did eventually. Um, yeah, that's exciting. So the boat's in and... Uh, Summer activities lined up. What's the what's your go to up there? Like, what's the the fun thing to do? I mean, honestly, I like to go into town, into Duluth. We're outside of town. Um, I really like to be down by Lake Superior. So my son and I will go down there at least a couple times a week. Adam likes to just work the property, so we don't. He doesn't really ever <laughs> leave the property. And then um, once the boat's in, we'll go tubing and skiing pretty much every day. Like after lunch, what's the water temp? Sorry. Um, it gets warm. We live on a small lake, so it'll get to the upper 70s, low 80s even. Nice. But right now, I haven't even touched it yet. It's probably, I don't know, maybe low to mid 60s. Not bad. And it's not bad. It's never that fish? bad because it's small. Yes. So okay. that's another reason the boat is getting dropped into a different lake first because my sister-in-law is a hardcore fisher and Adam loves to fish and my nephew is too. And they have someone taking the musky fishing. It's gross. Do you know what that is? They're like huge. Yeah. So they're going to a big lake tomorrow to do that. Um, but I'm, I saw that you fish. I know that you fished when you, you were going to go fishing when you almost ripped your thumb off. And you also, I saw that you were fly fishing. Mm-hmm. I'm okay. not really a fisher girl, woman. Yeah. It's not for everyone. It's How like, is the fly fishing? It's really fun. I'm not very good. It's been like been years since I've gone fly fishing. Um, but got back into it, picked it up okay, and caught some good fish. Just uh, the the photo was great where I couldn't hold on to it. It was the <laughs> biggest fish of the day, so I'm told. I think everyone was trying to make me feel good, but just like it was like the comedy, you know, like it's slipping out of my hands when I'm doing the. Yeah, it was part. awesome. It flew out. I'm like, yeah, I cannot keep my shit together. Everyone else. What are like- your water activities? Because you live on a lake too, or by a lake, right? Yeah. Um, Fishing is great. Um, I love kayaking. That's always fun around here. So we have Lake Charlevoix, which is pretty large, and we can go there and um, use Ryan's ski boat, which I don't ski. I just sit and hang out. And then there's Lake Michigan, which is what we're on, and that's a massive lake. Um, and then my my in laws do a lot of sailing, and Ryan oh. ra- races sailboats. But really, I'm more of a participant, like in a spectator kind of way, like. I'll yeah. watch you guys do your stuff. And I was talking about uh, this with a friend who is a big sailor as well. And I'm like, after this, like, I'm, I feel the hand thing. I feel like I don't, I'm nervous about any sailing because you just, your natural instinct is to grab ropes when they're moving or whatever. Like, yeah, that's how you lose fingers, obviously. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so I'm clearly not that savvy with sailing line. <laughs> you know how to sail. I have no idea how to sail. Do you do a stand up paddleboard ever? I do. If we get calm out here, it's pretty nice. But yeah. Lake Michigan gets really choppy. It's a little it's a, rough. It's a bigger, yeah. So. Yeah. That's what one of my favorite things is Adam and I will go paddleboard like the perimeter of the lake 
Nice. We call it like a date. It's cute. It's really cute. <laughs> I really are like Are you doing like that. A, a yoga? Like, are you yoga on the paddleboard? I hear people do that. That seems like insane. I, I can't do yoga on the ground. So, <laughs> fair enough. Okay. <laughs> so, that's a hard no for me. I just so stand up and go around. You're a normal person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm always intrigued by people doing that. I'm like, I could barely stand on that thing. Yeah. Not, no yoga for me. Very cool. Well, um, that's great. Well, it sounds like you got a good summer lined up. A lot of fun things on the agenda. A lot of family time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yep. And the rest of your family is nearby? My older sister lives in, in Duluth in the city. And then my mom lives one house down from us. So like about 200 meters. And then my little sister lives in Oregon, but she and her family come out for 10 days in July and we call it cousin camp. That's great. So we're all excited for that because it's really fun for us all to be together. That's cool. That's a good way to um, tee up the topic that we're going to kind of hit on today, which is really support teams and the network we build um, in training and obviously running the individual sport. But I think we all like you get to a finish line and everyone's like, I want to thank my team. Like, what Mm -hmm. does that look like? And obviously family is a huge part of that. And um, having them close by us to be fun now where they always a big part of your team in your career or is it like kind of gone in and out as you've went through your running career? Well, my family's always been like my biggest fans. Like they made sweatshirts that said like, I'm Kara's mom, I'm Kara's sister. When I was (laughs) the first time I was expected to win the NCAA cross country meet and I didn't. So we had all these sweatshirts. They were like, take them off. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) They were like, well, we'll put these away for a year. Um, And then it worked out. But um, my family, my mom and sisters and my grandparents, like just have always been hardcore support. And when I was a professional, I really leaned on them. When I was in Oregon Project, I was kind of more isolated from them. But whenever I would get injured or whenever I had downtime, Adam and I would come here, like specifically where I am now, except for Mm -hmm. two houses down. Um, And I just, my family always reminds me that I'm more than just a runner and that like that the success doesn't matter. To, I think it's comforting to have those people where it just doesn't matter. Like, of course, they want me to do well because they want me to be happy, but they really just don't care. They're just excited to be able to hang out. And so I relied on them a lot. And then after I had Colt, I really relied on my mom and sister because they would come to the competitions and take care of Colt. So like they'd have, we'd have like adjoining hotel rooms or whatever, but like when it came down to it, he was sleeping with them. They were getting him food. So I wouldn't have to worry about that kind of stuff. I remember, um, I think it was 2014 Boston. No, it must have been 13. It was the year of the bombing uh, because I was watching that year. And I had to do an interview and uh, they wanted me in the friends and family viewing area so they could find you and then take you out to the finish line to do the interview. And your whole family was in there. (laughs) There's not a worse place to watch a race like because it's everyone's (laughs) friends and families and agents and like all of the people that are in the race, their support support crew is in this room. And like you want to like have candid conversation about the race, but you're going to you're going to offend someone for sure. Even if you're not being mean, you're just like if you said exactly what you're watching, be like, oh, she's off the back. You'd be like. No, she's not. Like that's my <laughs> yeah. girl. Uh, but I watched with them in there, and it was cool. It was like they—they're all in there. They're rooting you on. But then it was also like Colt was playing around. Your sister would like—I think it was your sister was like watching him, and like I was like, they're so brave for being in here. <laughs> well, that's that. So they already liked you. They liked you in 2011 because. You beat me at Boston Marathon, but you were like super good to me um, and like kind to me, like even at the awards and stuff like that. So they already liked you, but that was the meat that sealed your fate, which is that they are hardcore still, Des Linden fans, like right. hardcore. Like they watched Boston this year, even though I wasn't calling it or racing it because they wanted to see how you did. So that like sealed your fate because you were nice to them and nice to Colt. <laughs> Yeah, I felt I was like, let the kid run around in the hotel lobby or something, play with the dog. Like this poor room. Is- he's so uninterested in the racing. Yeah, yeah. That um, I really feel like, and anybody in the media is listening, someone should do an article on like those rooms because I feel like it would just be an interesting behind the scenes. Um, moment yeah, and you're so right because everyone is it's their loved one out there pouring their heart out there. And so just what you said, even if you're like, oh, she looks a little tired, they're going to be like, wait, what? You know, like, <laughs> so it's, what an awkward 
Situ- like everyone's trying to win and all their family members are together. Yeah. So if you're putting like your core people, so you've finished the race and these are the people you want to see first and it's your core crew, but they have to wait in this room. Who's on your list? Like they have to wait in the room for me to get to them? Yeah. Like you're like, these are the first, like we're going to usher you out to the finish line. And these are, this is your list of people that you can see however many you want, but it's your core support crew. Who are you taking out? Um, I'm This taking, is a hypothetical. Okay. Obviously. I'm taking my husband and my son. Yep. And my start. sisters and my mom. And at this point in my life, that's probably it. But back in the day, probably my coach, massage therapist. Um, I still have a therapist, uh, bodywork therapist that I still see once a week. Um, I bring him out because he's kept me semi-healthy in my old age. I don't know. That's a tough question. Let's go back for a second. <laughs> Talk about your family and how they play into your race day or just like your recovery or race schedule, anything like that. Yeah. Um, they're my sister and her husband are like biggest fans. So they're always there. They're always supportive. Um, she's in obviously prior to her being married, she would go on her own and like number one fan figure it out with Ryan. And then I was actually telling, this isn't really going to answer the question, but I was telling the story the other day and it actually makes a lot of sense here. But the, in 2011, when I finished second, you know, you're get, you finally get to your stuff. I got my phone and I was like, I'm going to call my mom. Cause my parents didn't come out that year. Like they were just like, Oh, you're not very good. <laughs> you know, like I think in college they were just like, this isn't as fun to watch cause you don't win. And like, you're kind of in the middle of the pack. And so they started to coming to a less stuff. So 2011, I finished second and I called my mom and she was like, I'm at work right now. I'm on a ladder. Can you just call me back later? <laughs> and I was like, Oh, okay. I, I just want to let you know I finished second in Boston. She's like, I okay. almost won the Boston marathon, mom. <laughs> She's like, okay, I'm on a ladder. Can I just call you later? And I was like, yeah, it's fine. Um, and then I think they probably went back and watched the race and then they were like, Oh, like we're going to start going. Cause you're good again. Yes. <laughs> were they there in 2018? They were, yeah. I think after 2011, they were like, "No, we're fans. Like we're number two fan, right behind right, Natalie, right. who didn't miss a beat." Um, so they they're into it. Um, and then like growing up, they're they're just super into sports in general. So they like watched all the stuff. They wouldn't miss a game. Um, and and my mom is pretty critical. In a she tries to be helpful and like we really should think about doing more tempos or like maybe you're ready for a coaching change have you thought about going to so and so um so she like follows all the stuff and she knows what's going on and yeah um which is good and bad at times so sometimes well that's interesting because like my mom knew nothing about running and (laughs) it was a win although she used to say when i was in high school she'd be like well, if I lost, she'd be like, well, you were the prettiest one out there. And I was like, I don't want to be pretty. I want to be <laughs> Not the goal. fucking good. Yeah. <laughs> but that was just her way of being like, it doesn't matter, you know. But I do feel lucky. I mean, they learned though. My family learned as it went. Like they knew all your stats. They knew all of Shalane's stats. Like by the end, like they they know it all now. And my little sister ran as well and she was really good too. So um, – but when I was like coming up through the sport, it was just like this unclaimed sport. Like my grandpa ran, but he didn't race, right? So it was just like my mom wouldn't dare to give me like any advice because she wouldn't, she would have no idea what to say. <laughs> just try your best, sweetie. Yeah, just do your best. I love you. You look pretty. Yeah. Thanks. That's great. There's like, there's obviously a point where that's super helpful where it's just like they're not critiquing or judging or it's not calculated. It's just like family love. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and I feel like it. Like my parents certainly had that as well. Like in London, twenty twelve, I had to drop out from the games, and it was really tough and really kind of embarrassing because my whole family went out and stuff. And it was like we had this party, and like nobody cared. They were just stoked. They're like, "Oh, we're at the Olympics. This is amazing!" Like you ran in the Olympics, and like yeah, like a mile. They're like, "Who cares? This is so fun." Yeah. Um, so sometimes like the detachment from what's going on and being super serious is is very helpful too. When you got injured or had like a bad race, what was your go-to? Like, would you just go back home and disappear? Would you spend time with friends or family? Would you and Ryan do something? Like, what would be your way of like dealing with a disappointment? Show me when I had a bad race. I didn't. Jeez. <laughs> no, Damn it. I have no. <laughs> um, no, yeah, for sure. I, I, uh, 
I think I would process with Ryan. Um, I did have a like a long stretch where I just like developed and kept getting because I started from really far back. So to get where I got was just a long streak of improvement. So the lulls were really like not terrible anyhow or not very long. I think after London when I was hurt and then it was like, okay, you're really starting from a lower spot than the trajectory you've been on. Um, that was hard. And that was like, I had people who were not in running. Like they just didn't, they kind of loosely followed the sport, but they just sort of like, it was my friend from Moose Jaw and her husband who is in finance and um, like, this is terrible, but like they just had a different lifestyle. Like they would just, you know, like Thursday, Friday, Saturday bender. Yeah. <laughs> like, and you like go out to the bars and like, that that's sort of I would just detach from running and then be like okay I'm like I feel gross about myself I need to get back at it and it would make you forget the the bad race pretty quickly. Well, that's good. Yeah, it's not really that healthy. <laughs> it's not really good as I say it, but you know we yeah, all have but our sometimes outlets. you do have to do that. Yeah, like you just have to be so removed and just I don't know. Like I remember showing up to practice not looking like a runner. But that's what I had to do to be able to be ready to go back and bear it again, you know, and try again. So I don't know. I think that makes you normal. What was like the longest stretch away, like where you're just like, I'm going to put this on the, did, like, did you take a big chunk of time off or like, I'm just going to set this aside and then rebuild? Kind of the weird thing is that after I won the medal in Osaka, I did not want to go back to training. Like you would have thought I would be so hungry to get back at it and like prove I was one of the best in the world. But instead, I felt like, oh, uh, it's like getting away. Like I was actually came to Minnesota and I didn't run while I was here. And then I was supposed to go back to practice and I extended my ticket. Like I extended it for a few days and I extended it again. And I wasn't running while I was here. And I was like, what am I like? What am I? What's wrong with me? I should be like so pumped to go back. But I, I ended up taking like a month away before I finally went back. And I, I think it was a, the right choice. Obviously, something was telling me like, you need some distance from your team and and just to be like a normal person and not have someone watching over me. Um, but I, you know, I didn't take a ton of downtime. So it was really just when I got injured that I would be forced to take downtime and I would almost always come to Minnesota or Colorado um, and just be with my family or Adam's family or my old friends, right? Like people that don't know and like they know the sport, but not in the way that we do and they don't live and breathe it the way that we do. Yeah. I think that's interesting. I feel like um, John Ball, my chiropractor, whenever I'm like in a lull, like for motivation or whatever, he's just like, we really have to examine that and ask why. There's probably something happening or going on because you're a pretty motivated person. You obviously want this. You obviously care about this. So if you can't get out the door and it's like a consistent thing and you're not excited, like you're probably right on the bubble of an injury or getting sick or something else is going on because we're, we're very motivated people like just kind of built into what we're doing. So that was an interest, like an eye opening thing for me where I like started looking at motivation as sort of a sign for other things after that conversation. Yeah. I think for a long time in my career, when the season was over, I wanted to escape, which I think tells you a lot. <laughs> I'd be like, well, I'm going to go to the woods in Minnesota. I'll be back in a week or so, you know? So like, yeah, looking back, that was telling me like, you're not really happy here, right? But coming back here and being able to chill out with my family and my old high school friends or whatever, like helped me to be like, okay, no, I love running. I need to get back at it. But I had to like physically remove myself from the situation. That's kind of, that's interesting where it's like you have, obviously the people who are preparing you care of the athlete and its sponsors and coaches and the massage therapists and all of that stuff. And like, they're taking care of you, but also it's very intense and very, mm -hmm. um, just focused. Right. And so when you're in that moment and you're getting ready for peak performance, like that's the team. Yes. And they do all the things to get you ready, but then but they're not my recovery team. Yeah, that's that's exactly it. It's like recovery <laughs> team versus like high end tip of the spear performance team, and it's very different things. So tell me, who was your your big support teams? Like, like you just said, there are like kind of two different teams. But when you were lining up to race, 
let's just say you had a great race. You finish. You're not lining up. You're already done. Okay. And you're like, in this moment, who am I the most grateful for? Like, who would come to mind for you? Um, I would, I mean, Ryan, because he puts up with me. Like, I think like <laughs> when you're in that deep training stretch, I'm just assuming this is a marathon because that's basically all I do now. Um, like, everything's hyper-focused and it is the high-performance team. And it's like me, 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 me. I need like my this, my that. And he is like, yeah, I get it. It's your job. I put up with it. Not put up with it, but he's like, he understands it. Mm -hmm. And he doesn't act like he's just putting up with it. It's like, how can I chip in to make you the best you possible? So he's around it the most. And so it's him. Um, And then I would roll, roll back to my coach who is, you know, doing all the workouts, giving me all the information. Um, I'm on the phone with like after Boston this year is like, Hey, uh, I'm going on book tour two weeks before the race. And he's like, what the, (laughs) okay. Like we got to get on the phone every day and talk about how you're feeling, what you're going to do and why you're doing it. And do we need more? Like we would talk through before every run, like what's it going to be today? And so he's like in it very closely to what Ryan is. Um, and then, you know, Josh, my agent is managing the athletic side, the coach side, like he's just keeping stuff off my plate that I don't, I'll never know about. Cause he's like, you're not even going to see this. Cause it's just a pain in the ass. It's just a distraction. So he's fielding those things. Um, and then physio would be John ball. Um, he's like the magician. And I feel like he works with so many great athletes and, Everyone has that hyper-focused thing where it's them, it's me. And so he's like Ryan dealing with like 10 me's (laughs) because everyone's like, I have the most important race coming up and my injury or like my treatment is the most important and I need the most focus. Um, And he like just does it. And it's, it's so impressive. And I don't know how the guy, um, deals with a bunch of high-end pro athletes who are selfish. <laughs> so that would be my top well, – I think that was five. That's pretty good. And also that's a totally different topic, but very interesting about John Ball because the two Nike teams I ran for, we had our own people mm-hmm. and our own circle. And we only yeah. were sharing it with our teammates. And like we were all running different events, right? So I never had to have that feeling of like, wait. I mean, the only time I ever had that feeling was when – the 2016 trials, I was working with Marcus Hillies, who I still see. I think he's a genius. And um, he had like three other athletes there. And I was like, well, that feels weird. Like, are you here for me? Are you here for <laughs> you know? It was like so stupid because he yeah. met with all of us and got it all done, you know. But yeah, there's that feeling of like, wait, this is the biggest day for me. So you're having to share him with everyone. But it sounds like he does a good job of making everyone feel important and meeting everyone's needs. He does. I don't know how he, like, he just doesn't really have a life. I mean, I'm sure he does, but it's like, I don't know, like, the time, every, like, everyone has 24 hours a day. Like, I, John has found some magical time to fit everything <laughs> in. Yeah, like, I don't know how you do it. Um, but he's he's a perfectionist, and he's so dedicated and cares so much. And it's like, okay, we'll work from, you know, 10 a.m. to 3 then I'm going to take my kids to practice and feed them and make sure they're like with their grandparents or whatever. And then I'll see you at like 8 PM till 11. And you're like, okay, well, it sounds terrible, but I'm yeah. not the one. Yeah. Like it's, it's pretty wild. So it's impressive that he does that. And, and he's like, he's part physio, like he's working on you. He's doing all the stuff, but like when you have that person that you're like, they're a mastermind, they just like the smartest person in the world. They're also part sports psychologist oh yeah where they're like yes you can run yes you can get through this yes this is, or they're if they say no you're like oh shit like this is yeah. not good and you that built that experience? trust with him right yeah totally yes when they're like you're you know what this is okay you're gonna be okay you're like okay because you've built all that trust but if they're like i don't know if you should run on that you're like wait what <laughs> <laughs> right <laughs> because they know you and they know like how hard you train and they know Right. So when they express concern, then you're like, oh my God, it's like Colt barely cries. And he never, like, he used to fall and get shiners. And we'd be like, you're fine, shake it off. So when he actually did fall and cry, we'd be like, oh, this is real. You know? (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) So it's the same kind of thing. Like when they say no, you're like, wait, what? I'm seriously injured. What does your physio say about your knee? Is that like, 
he thinks I'm crazy, but he also like, he thinks that I, he doesn't think I should get a knee replacement. You know, he's like, you're managing it and he works on it a lot. And I basically tell him that I see him on Tuesdays. And so I'm always like, fix me so I can do a good run tomorrow. And so then I <laughs> run hard on Wednesdays. Thursdays is medium. Fridays I'll run kind of hard again. And then I'm kind of piecemealing it till I can see him again. And it's, it's actually funny because we live in the same neighborhood and everything. There are so many times like he'll come over for dinner and I want to be like, oh, God, I just wanted him to yeah, work on me. But I? I'm like, boundaries. <laughs> He's here as a friend. Don't abuse the relationship. Yeah. Shout out to Marcus. Thanks for always keeping me semi-healthy, as healthy as I can be at this point anyway. Yeah, for sure. Huge part of it. Yeah. What about – okay. I guess one thing we neither of us have really talked about is – um brands like how hmm. have you felt i mean you've kind of seen a lot and some of it's been super supportive and some of it's been terrible um what's stuff that stands out as supportive and that really worked for you that you're like yeah but more brands need to be doing this um oh, that's such a loaded question i know i know that well <laughs> take, there were take times it where you'd like i know well there were times with nike where i did feel really supported like for instance I, my favorite color is pink and I didn't want to wear this green uniform. And so they made me a pink uniform so that I didn't have to wear the green uniform. And it was so simple and stupid. It was like literally just a crop top. But to me, it felt like, oh, they see me and they care about like what makes me feel good and all that kind of stuff. You know, I think anyone that's read my book knows it went sour like pretty quickly after I had my son because I didn't feel supported. But, um, and you know, it, in contracts, it's written in reduction. Like I don't have no idea what your contract look, looks like, but my contract had re a lot of reductions. And you know, you're coming off of an injury or a pregnancy, and you're making choices that you know aren't good long term because you don't want to face that reduction. And so that doesn't feel like supportive, right? Because you're like, well, you're making me make a choice that we both know is not good for my career. Um, but I think you know, like. Nike would turn up for me like they would make signs and shirts and when I was running well they really like the I would say the marketing team did a good job of like hyping me which is which is great and then I wor I've worked with other brands really mostly Wazelle and Skechers when I was still racing Wazelle like they were kind of like my family like we want you to be happy but we don't really care like we don't we want you to be happy and run the best race you can but we're just so excited to be here with you and to help you you know yeah. which was which was good although there I did eventually have to like form some boundaries like pre-race boundaries like I can't actually have you guys come over and hang out in my hotel room, right? <laughs> and that that was the first major competition I ran in New York in 2014. And afterwards, Wetmore was like, I love Wazel. I love how much they support you. But if I show up to your room the night before and there's a bunch of Wazel people there ever again, I'm going to lose my mind, you know? <laughs> so we had to just set like those, but they didn't know, right? They hadn't had someone racing at that level, especially in the marathon. So I just think there's ways that you can feel really supported, like they're invested in you as a whole person. And then there's sometimes where you're unfortunately reminded that it is a business. And that's, as an athlete, that's tough because you're always putting it all out there. Like, I can't think of a race where I quit, you know, but if you didn't meet this certain benchmark, then you're facing a serious consequence financially from it. What was it like for you or how has it been for you? You're still racing. Yeah. I, I mean, that makes a lot of sense. And it is interesting in like the boundary between friendship or it's not personal, it's just business and the two mm -hmm. sides of it. It's, it's always a big part of the equation. Um, my, I think it, the structure is very different, like at different times in my career. Cause when I first signed with the Hansons, it was a bonus only structure, which is that awesome. Blows my mind. Right. Like, well, it for, gave you opportunity, but yeah, yeah, like at the moment it was like, this is great. Like I can hit all these bonuses and like, you know, I was all of a sudden like, crushing it and you're like this is a great contract unless um you know i get hurt and so it was presented at bon bonuses only but then they would often be like well we don't have reductions like you kind of do but also you, you can't really reduce someone from zero um so i think after 11 2011 i was obviously in position to kind of restructure things and and shape them differently and they stood by, you know, no reductions. And that was something that they put into the contract with 
an actual guaranteed base salary, which is nice, and then still bonus. Oh, that's amazing. And the whole thing. So they stood by the no reduction thing, which was really great. And I think that part was something that allowed me to make long-term smart decisions and think long game. And like coming back off the 2012 injury, it wasn't like I have to perform next month or even next year. It was like, let's do the right trajectory at the right pace back. Um, so that was, that was really cool. And I think my relationship with the brand directly kind of grew um, throughout my career. And, and now it's like this kind of independent thing. I'm not part of the team. And so I have contacts over there and work with the brand to the point where I was named chief running advisor, which is like the strangest title ever. But basically, I just get dropped into projects with Brooks. And so, um, yeah, that's, you know, again, it's like looking at me as more than just the athlete, like we want you to help the brand as a whole, which is rare and it's very cool. So super cool. So this isn't a knock on Brooks if the answer is yes, because I think most contracts are like this, but do they normally have reductions in their contracts and you got, you were able to argue to not have them or are they just in general don't have reductions? I, I believe they just in general don't have them. So what's interesting is that their first professional athletes, I think, or like the first contracts they were doing were the Hanson's ones. Mm. So that was kind of the template for a long time. And then they added the beasts. And I think that that sort of, hey, we don't have reductions model, um, even though it was not totally accurate when it's bonus only, uh, but it's still stuck and they saw the value in that. And that, I think, I think rolled into most of the the contracts um, that they started doing after just having that original Hanson's one. Yeah, that's cool. So, yeah. Yeah. That's interesting. Nike, all Nike contracts have reductions, at least they did when I was there. My Skechers contract, my Ultra contract, my Wazelle don't. Um, no requirements. I mean, there's requirements. Don't get me wrong. There's like appearances. <laughs> right, there's right. like, I have to do stuff, um, but not performance wise. And obviously now, like, what are you going to reduce me from? I can't even, I'll never race again, probably. So. But it's, I do think that when you don't have reductions, you know, I believe that if I didn't have those reductions after I had Colt, I think I would have, like my career could have gone maybe a couple of years longer because I made some bad choices because I was like, I have to race. I You're have to stop the clock. the clock. I'm already being reduced. Yeah. I have to like not, I can't get another one. I can't afford to get another one. So I think companies thinking long-term by not having reductions that's different than having requirements like, oh, you're not racing at all or you're not doing any appearances or you're not doing social. There should be a consequence to that. But that's different than like you didn't race hard enough or place high enough right. or – Yeah. 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 And it's like a control the controllables type of thing where it's like, yes, I can go race and I can be engaged in the community. I can do stuff for the brand, but like I'm not going to try to – I don't know. I can't finish top five in the world this year because I just had a time. Right. <laughs> and also like you can't always guarantee you're going to be top five in the world, right? Yeah, like, right. Yeah. yeah, like everything can go perfectly right and you can run a personal best and still be seventh. And then you're like, well, I just ran the best race of my life, but I'm about to be reduced. So <laughs> would you, here's a random question, but would you, if you were designing the perfect contract, would you take lower base guaranteed, but with really high performance incentives or like, hey, this is probably going to be your best year. Let's put your base salary at that, but you have reductions if you don't perform at the level to earn like what you would earn those with bonuses. Are you like uh, afraid to lose it or um, I think like, want to win it? Yeah, that's a really great question. I, I think that I would probably prefer a lower salary that I know is guaranteed for a while with the opportunity to make more versus – a huge salary, but knowing that like if I get an injury or I don't place high enough, I'm going to be sliced. But, you know, I've never been that good financially. So <laughs> what would you do? <laughs> I don't know. I tend to agree with that. Like I like the idea of chasing down the bonuses and like having that versus like, oh, this is the best it can get and all I can do is mess it up. <laughs> yeah. You know, I, I, it worked against me in this situation, but in 2014, New York offered me a contract and I was like, I, I will not take that because no, no, no. It was in 2012. No, it wasn't 2014. 
I was like, I'm not going to take that because that then I'm saying that that's my value. And so they were kind of like, okay, well, we're, we're willing to go higher, but then we're going to put a ton of reductions in there. And I was like, I'm fine with that. And then yeah, <laughs> yeah I, I had a horrible race. I totally blew up all this stuff. I didn't, you know, I ran, I didn't even run the, the trial standard or the, the trials a standard. It was like 237. I ran 237 something. And so, um, like at the end of the day, I got what they initially offered me because I had such a huge reduction. But I was kind of like still worked out because I walked away with the same yeah. amount of money, but at least I had a shot to get That's more. That's like the bet on yourself <laughs> mentality there, right? Like, yeah, I'll take that. Like, yeah. I, I could do that. I'm not going to be, I'm not going to have a bad day. Yeah. And I thought was such a bad day for me, but um, it's tough. It's tough to know what to do, right? I mean, yeah, I just wonder yeah. uh, as an agent, like if you read your athlete, like, hey, this person is totally motivated by this, or they like, you know, are very tentative when it, it comes to that. But I think it's all like boilerplate. <laughs> you got to know your athletes though, a little bit, right? If you're a good agent, like Josh definitely would know what motivates you versus what does it. Yeah, for sure. We yeah. Would talk about it. Yeah. That's probably the bigger thing. Like, do you talk to your athlete? <laughs> <laughs> That is a big thing. When yeah. this and again, this is years ago, but I remember being in Europe and leaving Italy to fly to my next race, and an athlete who was very, very good, being like, "I can't get a hold of my agent. I they're telling me I can't stay another night in this hotel. I don't know if I'm in another race. I don't know if I have a plane ticket. Like, I don't know where I'm supposed to go." And I was, and this is like before we had smartphones, so we could just like easily, you know. I was just like, "I'm so sorry. I'm leaving because I have a flight." <laughs> Go to the internet cafe. Good luck. Yeah, go to the internet cafe, <laughs> log in and see if there's a flight booked on your United account. Like that's so stressful. That is yeah. so stressful. I that's you shouldn't have an agent like that. <laughs> that's a good tip. Yeah. <laughs> Don't have an tip. agent like that. They should tell you what you're doing. You should know at all times where you're going. Yeah. So yeah. That's a lot. Um Agents, any any comments on that in terms of support crew? You want to go deeper into that, or are you just like f them? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think their agents are important for certain aspects. And again, I think that your agent needs to believe in you. Um, and and also, like when an agent has multiple athletes trying to run the same, let's just say, marathon, keep in mind that they might accept the lower fee for you because they want to make sure this other athlete gets in and gets some payment too. And that's that's tricky. And so you have to have a really good relationship so that you can trust them when they say, no, this is as much as they're going to give. And then you find out later, well, they were willing to go 30 more, but they were giving it to this other athlete. Agency is tough. Being an agent is a really tough job because you want to fight for all your clients, but inevitably you're sacrificing some athletes at times for others. Do you think that's true? Oh, hundred percent. It has to be yeah. like for the good of the agency, for the good of the relationship, like yeah, that's just how it is. And the agency can exist for as long as they want it to. And an athlete's career has a timeline on it. So that's just part of the situation. Did you represent yourself for a while? Um, Kind of. Yeah. So like I, when I left Nike, I kind of left my agent-ish. And you just used him on a, as a consultant basis. Dan Lilo, I really like the guy. He's awesome. Mm -hmm. um, and then like for a while, Adam was like, like Adam did my Wazelle and Skechers deals, but I, God bless him. <laughs> but he is a slow responder and I am not. Yeah. Like I see the email come in and I'm like, it's going to bug me. I can't relax. I got to get back where like a week or two goes by with him. And he's like, wow. oh, I'll get to it. So I was like, I'm firing you. <laughs> you know, I know we're saving 15% or whatever, but like, I actually can't do this. I'm so stressed out by it. So I, Adam stops. And then I was using Dan as a consultant. And then yeah. um, now I guess I'm kind of using Josh as a consultant too. So yeah, I mean, like there's a lot of things where I just represent myself, but if it's complicated or tricky and though, and I think those marathon contracts are a little bit trickier, right? Cause there's like, well, they can be written really simply, but a lot of them are trickier with negotiating the money and the bonuses and the reductions and stuff like that. It's a little over my, what I want to worry about. I just want to worry about training. Yeah, that's fair. What about now? Would you, would you, do you find that space interesting or are you just like, no, it's too. Like for me to be an agent? Yeah. Hell no. <laughs> <laughs> All right. No, I would never want to be an agent. Like I just think it's such a hard job. 
What? And you're, what about it? Like, like you're just constantly hustling, right? Like you're hustling to get your athletes into meets. You're hustling to get your athletes appearance fees. You're hustling to get your athletes contracts. Right? Like it's just, I respect the profession. It is not for me. <laughs> what about you? Would you want to be an agent? Not particularly. I think it'd be fun to do the deals I wouldn't want to do. Like just like, one or two deals, you know. Oh my God, you guys hear, I heard you, it here first. I could get you your like shoe deal and I could get you into major marathons, but then you do your thing. <laughs> but that that's what a lot of people need, just that. Yeah. Right? Call yeah. her up. I did I, up. I did order or print it printed off all the information for the test, the agency the agent test, but I'm like, I haven't looked at it once. So probably not gonna happen. <laughs> I would hire you. All right. No. <laughs> You could have a booming business. Not that you need it, but you could. Seems like a lot of work. And then like travel and all that stuff. Yeah. yeah. Booking travel sucks. Yeah. Yeah. And traveling all the time. But I don't know. Well, you have a really unique relationship with your agent, I think. I think you guys are close in a way that most athletes aren't with their agents. Like I love Dan Lilo, but like I wasn't like going on vacation with him or anything like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Which I think is yeah. kind of cool. You guys have a very unique relationship and he still does well for other athletes. Like he still right. really supports other athletes and is there for them. So I think that's pretty cool. Yeah. I think it, it's worked out well. I think like I was his first like proper like, okay, I'm going to start an agency. This is my first athlete. Like he was helping other folks prior, just like consulting kind of. Um, so that's very different. And we're closer in age. Like we're not, I mean, we're peers, right? So. Now he's like working with 23 year olds and, and me, and it's like just easier to, we spend a lot of time together because we travel a lot and at events and the whole thing. It's like, we talk about a lot of the contracts, like what's going on in the industry, ups, downs and all that stuff. So it's nice to see all the different layers of it and not feel like it's just like, take care of me. Like right, I, right. like I have input, which is nice, <laughs> um, whether or not it's good input, you know, he, he decides. <laughs> That's good. So it's hard. I was thinking when you were talking about your coach, like you were checking in with him on a daily basis as you were approaching Boston Marathon. Do you think that you could coach yourself? No. <laughs> I would overthink everything. Like I could figure out a schedule and be like, this is what I'm going to do. Like I kind of, I mean, I did that for Boston 18, you know, like from the fall till that race. But then I was like, oh, I'm going to I have this opportunity to keep competing. Like, I think I'll be good for a little while here. So I'm going to hire a, a proper coach. And um, but I do think working with him, like I'm forced to learn and understand and contribute because like there was a moment where I was like, you know, whatever you write, I trust you. Like, this is what, like why I'm working with you. And he was like, no, 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 no. <laughs> you don't get to pass the buck. Like, this is a collaboration <laughs> We have to work together to do what's best, not just like me sending you the workout and this is what's best. It's like I, I need your feedback and like for you to gauge it. And and then that made me be like, okay, well, I need to know the whys of this stuff. And so I, like he'll send me articles and podcasts and all this stuff. And I'm like, okay, like I'm learning it. But I would overthink it. Be like, this probably should I do one more? Should I do one? Should I stop? Yeah, two before should I even be running today? Like, I don't know. <laughs> Are you used to before you were coached by Walt? Were you used to just being told what to do without oh, input? Okay. Yeah, it was yeah. like, and like I would, you know, at the beginning of a segment, be like, these are the races I would like to do. Like, I would like to approach it more from a speed standpoint or like a strength standpoint. Um, and then even like within the work, like sometimes I would just get antsy and be like, okay, well, like I'm going to go out slow and then finish hard today. Like, you know, like you could tweak cause really it was like, I could pull up a schedule and know ex like they would be really, really similar. Like the stable workouts are always pretty much the same. The mileage was always pretty much the same. Um, so the builds became a little dull to a degree where you're like, this is really predictable. Um, and I know exactly what the next eight weeks are going to look like. So you could tinker around with that if you were feeling good. Like, mm -hmm. this isn't fast enough, so I'm going to play around with it. Um, but it was like, it was very predictable. And it was, if you like skipped a couple second runs, like, well, this is why your race is going to fucking suck. <laughs> like, <laughs> I don't know. 
so you just wouldn't talk about it, you know? Yeah. How about you? Any input or were you like? Um, no input until the last couple of years of my like racing career. Yeah. So with Salazar or Schumacher, I didn't, I didn't pick what races I was doing. I didn't pick the workouts. Like I was told everything. And you know, like I always considered myself super coachable because I buy in and then mm-hmm. I just come and you tell me what to do. I do it. Um, but when I went back to Mark and Heather for those last couple of years, they were like, well, what workouts make you feel confident? What races would make you feel confident? I was like, what? Well, what do you know. want me to do? <laughs> <laughs> and, um, I think it was really good. And I think, I think at that point in my life, it was good to have some ownership in it and to have yeah, I was just at a different place. It caught me off guard at first because I was like, well, I'm, I've am i moved here because you guys are coaching me. Like, what do you mean? What do I want to do? You're you know? the expert. But, yeah, you're. <laughs> that's why I'm here. But I think in the end, it was good. It was really good because I got to like take ownership. I got to try things that I wanted to try. And um, there was no question that was like off the table. Like, could I do this? Could I race here? It was like, well, yeah, let's talk about it. So I, I really liked it. I It's interesting looking back if I was younger – <laughs> Would that have worked for me? Because you said sometimes you overanalyze or overthink things. That's totally myself. Like I'd be like, well, if I can do eight reps, then maybe I should just do the 10 because more is better, right? So I don't know if I would have been able to manage it as well. But that's why I always needed a coach too. Even though Mark and Heather and I was more collaborative, they were still standing there being like, you look tired today. I think we should cut it there. Or you're looking great. Let's do, you know, like I needed I needed that input because – and I, I think – I don't, maybe it's not for everyone, but I feel like that's the job of the coach is to be able to hold you back at times and then push you at times and get to know you and, re, and, and be able to see in your body like what needs to happen. I mean, I know you're being coached kind of via the phone and, and email and stuff, but you're still reporting back how you're feeling and all that kind of stuff. And I, I think one of the biggest jobs of the coach is actually to hold you back. Yeah. You know, because we'll just run ourselves into the ground. Right. More is better. Like faster Always. is better. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. How much do you think that there's a difference in college coaches and their approach versus the professional teams where they have their, I mean, I guess college coaches have their stable too, but it's kind of always rotating and you're still developing athletes where like yeah. pros are like, this is your level. This is where we have to get you. And yeah, it's I think it should bust. be different. Yeah. Like I went to Colorado and like right away, Wetmore was like, you're on a four-year plan. And I was like, what? No, I want to be good right now, you know? <laughs> and he was like, you can't. You don't have the mileage. You don't have the strength, but I'll get you there. So I th- And I think that's a good, healthy way to look at it. Like if you want to really develop and become the best runner you can be, you can't do it in one year or overnight, right? You have to think long-term. So that he taught me a lot about patience in training, but also in racing. Like it, patience really became like a big thing with him that I took with me later. But yeah, so once irritating. I went- yeah, I hate Just wait patients. longer. <laughs> yeah, I have to wait two more years. Okay. Um, but I think when you get to that professional level, like the goals are very clear, making teams. So it's it's a little bit harder to have that long-term view. I think you can still have it, but it's a little bit harder because you have a contract and you're getting paid and the, the end goal is be on teams and run fast times. How about Mark coaching you as a pro? Like, did you notice like this is very like – college athlete mentality, taking some of the good stuff, but also applying it in a professional, like, was that a hard thing to balance? Did you notice that he was like a college coach or was it like, nah, we're good. When I first, I ran for him for two years after college Yeah, and I definitely felt like, oh, he's a college coach and I'm just like an extra here. Mm -hmm. Um, Like I was doing the same workout, like it just was a different vibe than when I came back where he had a separate professional group and it it felt very, very different. It's a lot more work on him because he met <laughs> us separately than he met the college kids, right? So it was like two totally different training groups that he had essentially. And then when I was running the marathon, like then he had like three groups because right. I was the only one running that long. So uh, it was a lot more work for him. So when I was, when I first ran for him though, out of college, it, he was a college coach. That's what he was. And I was like, well, I don't want to leave. I, I run well under you, you know? And he was like, mm-hmm. great, but he hadn't, he wasn't viewing himself as like this professional coach yet. When I came back, he yeah. had kind of made that shift. That's interesting. That helps. Yeah. Like just yeah, that no. time to kind of learn it and figure out how to balance it. 
and mm-hmm. want to do it, right? Because if you're a college coach, like, do you really want to take on pros that probably, I mean, not right. many, not and like many the make seasons much money. Are, <laughs> the seasons are different too, right? Like in the summer where your college kids are out, well, that's when the European season and all the hot track meets are. So it, it really is a huge commitment to do both, I think. Yeah. It did takes go, a certain person. Did he go out to your races, um, like major marathons? Yeah, he even he went said. to like little half marathon I would do or I'd run a 5K in Portland. Like either here or Heather or at, one of them was at everything I did. Nice. So again, that stresses me out, which is what makes me realize why I could never be like a college coach or a professional coach because I'm like, that's so much travel. Right. <laughs> but I think that's what a great coach does. Like I appreciated that they were always there. Like I, when I moved back, I was a disaster. I had like a sacral stress fracture and – and they came to everything, you know, and even when I was running bad, they they were there and I appreciate it so much. And I think it helped build that trust of, you know, they do believe yeah, in me because they're seeing me at my worst and they're still invested. Yeah. So. Not for yeah. me. I'd be like, just stay <laughs> home. You got to stay home. When I have the, when I'm ready for a good race, I will invite you. <laughs> like save your time. We'll talk on the phone after. <laughs> I've had some pretty bad races, so. What you told me earlier, name a race I did bad in. Yeah, no, I could have I could have given you a list. Oh. It was a test. <laughs> <laughs> what about uh, you when you would like go to the start? Would you want to see your coach? Like who's the last person you would want to talk to before you start a race? <laughs> That's a two, there's two ways to look at that question. <laughs> the yeah, last yeah, okay. person. What's the last person in a good way? My ex boyfriend. Like the last <laughs> voice you want to hear in your head as you're going to the start line. Um it would probably be Ryan because he's like super optimistic and he'd be like, who cares? You're ready to win. <laughs> and I'd be like, yeah, that's right. Even though I totally wasn't, but it just make me happy. Um, practical advice. I, I'll talk to Walt and he's, he's really fun to work with because he just like peppers you with questions. So he's not like telling you anything. He's giving you the questions that you're going to ask yourself in the race. Like, well, what are you mm-hmm. going to do? This happens. What are you going to do that? And like, and it'll just throw stuff at you and it like makes you kind of plan for everything or be prepared for something that might pop up. So that that's really fun. And then it kind of puts you in the right mentality to be like problem solving. Um, but I think, you know, that's something that like night before morning, like or f- when you wake up and get on the bus, like those are kind of the space for that. And then Ryan is just like pure optimism where he's like, you're amazing. I okay, love that. Amazing. <laughs> Damn right. <laughs> yeah. So he's, yeah, last, last words from him, but, um, yeah, husbands in general, I feel like this was the last on my list. I think that they've both played a huge role in our support team and they're like probably the closest person around it. I think your situation's interesting because you've been like both sides of that where you're like, okay, this, his race is very important. And then you have to switch to like, now my race is very important. Um, and maybe even career wise too, where there was like a shift but how has Adam helped your career? How's, how, what role does he play in your support team? He's a little bit like Ryan. He like believes I can do anything. Like he believes I could still go out and like rip a marathon. I'm like, babe, I like don't even have a left leg, you know? Um, but also because, and Ryan raced, raced at a high level too, because he was there, his words mean a lot to me. You know, like my mom and my sisters are like, we love you. You can do it. But I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. But you have no idea what I'm about to go try to do, <laughs> right? Where Adam actually does know and he has the credentials. He's an Olympian. He's done all these amazing things. So he – and he ta- he would talk me off the ledge all the time, you know, like I – you know, I – as you know, because I ranted before we started recording today, I get I get myself on these little like tizzies and then it like come becomes this thing that I can't let go of where he's just like – don't, why are you worrying about that? That doesn't matter. You know, you focus on yourself. You focus on the work you've done. Um, and he always left notes in my racing shoes my entire career, ever since we started dating. So I would have all these little notes from Adam. Adam. Yeah. And it would be short, but it would be like, (laughs) you're fucking ready. You know, you, you've had the best training of your life. Like even for small meets. So he'd be like, this is your comeback is beginning. So I can't say, you know, cheesy, but I can't say enough good things. He's been super supportive, even though, even at times when the dynamic was tricky, Mm -hmm. he was still so supportive. Was there ever like something that was off limits where like him being supportive was like, I know not to touch this or like, don't go, 
you know, there was, was there anything that he, it was like the support is not stepping in right now with me. Yeah. Uh, well, he would know to not like be cheery if I had like a major bomb. I'm thinking like one of the hardest days for us as a couple was when I made my first Olympic team and he didn't. And we were both raced on the same night. It was both of our last chances. Like I won the five and then he got sixth or seventh in the 10. And that was really challenging for both of us because I felt so bad for him. He had worked through so much to get to that starting line. But also this was like the happiest moment in my running career. I was going to the Olympics, you know, and it was, he wanted to be happy for me, but also he was like mourning the loss of a dream. So that was probably one of the worst, honestly, experiences. I can't even imagine that. Yeah. I don't know. Like. Because he had every right to like be really sad and to, right. um, he wasn't very supported by our coach to be angry. He, all those things were valid. Um. And I got that, but I was also like, I'm going to the Olympics though. Just this the is my childhood it, dream. Right? Yeah, the timing of it was terrible. Give us two days. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. One day, fine. Yeah, that's yeah, that was tough. That'd be really hard. Yeah. Have you and Ryan, like, has Ryan raced too? Did you ever have like a difficult situation where one of you was running well and one wasn't? Um, I think one thing that was hard is like when he sort of phased out of running and like he's, you know, likes biking and he's done triathlons for a while and like he's just kind of doing fun stuff and it's not at nearly as a serious level as it was so we would do so much together and we could do workouts together and it was like for me like okay nobody cares about this at the same level that I do and also like should I keep caring about this to the same degree or is it weird like should I be finding my new cycling venture or whatever it is. And so that was kind of a moment where I had to really decide if I wanted to keep like plugging away. And I was like, I still really like it. And then he would jump, like he would jump in workouts every now and then and still be good enough to keep up. And that was really irritating. <laughs> <laughs> and then that, that faded oh, I, away. I know that feeling so yeah. well. You're like, I'm training my ass off and you just jumped in and had no problem meeting my pace. Yeah. Did you yeah. guys, did you and Adam train together often? Like we're like towards your marathoning career days. He did. He really helped me come back from a cult. Yeah. But it was almost like an abusive relationship because I was so mean to him. And of all people, Alberta was like, you are so mean to him. <laughs> and I was like, I know. It's like when you're mean to your mom just because you can be. Yeah. Like I was under so much stress. And so if we, were, let's just say we were doing like a 20 mile run or, or 10 mile tempo, whatever it is, he's setting the pace. And if he's like two seconds off, I'm irate, right? And it's like totally ridiculous. This is the scheme of this huge <laughs> workout. This, you know, but I'd be like, oh my God, it's way too slow. Blah, blah, blah. And then if he would speed up too much, I'd be like, I can't, I can't turn over that fat. We have to get it back over a half mile, you know? And I would just be such a bitch. Like, really? Yeah. Like, so, you're the hardest on the people you love the most. Yes. But like, I totally relate to everything you just said, where it'd be like, if you're one second, fast you're actually slow i'd be like we're fucking slow get out of the way like i'll lead this one if you would not lead then i would be like well why are you just sitting on me you're like just sucking off my pacing and then he would go and lead and i'd be like well why are you one stepping like you just can't win you know it's no like i i can't i'm so <laughs> thankful you just said that because i'm gonna have adam listen to this and be like it's just tough it's yeah. tough in marriages <laughs> So what I'm saying is thank you for your support. I'm sorry. I'm sorry I am the way I am. But obviously it's something that right. we, we all do. <laughs> like later in at, towards the end of my career, like headed towards the 2016 trials, he would sometimes bike with me or like go out with Mark and Heather and hold this like cheer. And that didn't bug me at all. I actually loved that. But yeah, it was something about when he would be pacing me in those super intense workouts. It was like I had other people that would pace me like – I had a paid pacer and he could be five seconds off on the first laugh of, of a mile repeat. And I'd be like, it's okay. And Adam is five seconds off at the half mile in a 10 mile run. And I'm like, I rate. I would do that to everyone. Cause I'm just mean. Be like, You're not mean. Get out of my way. I think what I like is to just sort of suffer on my own. Like when I'm suffering, I'm like, don't watch me. Yeah. And I feel like every workout, I'd be like, this could go into a place where I'm going to suffer. And so I just want to do it by myself. Like, don't assist. Stay away. But do you think that you had better workouts when you had someone pulling you along? Or did you, were you just mostly on your own? Mostly on my own. <laughs> like, I think That's I'm just better. Fascinating like, to me. Yeah. Like, 
I don't have any problem pushing myself. I know how to hurt. Like, and I think that's why I'm like so great at pacing. And maybe that's the problem. Like, maybe I just got really good at pacing and like, you know, I, if it's stepping away from that a little bit, I'm like, I'm not going to do it because I know what I can do. And so racing, that's not great. Unless I don't know. You're is. pretty successful. Like, unless it is, like at times it can be, right? So. Yeah. I no, I had a hard, I have a hard time going like really pushing on my own. Yeah. So like when I moved back to Colorado, Joe Bosshard would do a lot of my really hard workouts with me or Adam would be on the bike. I don't know why. I don't know if like I didn't have a problem when I was in college or anything. Maybe I got soft running for Alberto because he always had a pacer for me. Like even if we were at altitude camp, there would be some guy meeting me, like random guy meeting me that would get like $10,000 worth of Nike gear at the end of the summer or whatever. <laughs> So maybe I just got soft and like, I think that's why Shalane and I worked well together because she liked to lead mm -hmm. and I like to follow. And yeah. so that, that worked out for us. But, um, yeah, I, I, I definitely am better as a leech hanging on. It's harder for me to push myself on my own. That's pretty common and fair. Maybe I'm just leaving a ton of time on the table. No, I, I like, think that I, you've had a lot of success because you know yourself, like where yeah. I... I don't think it was anything wrong, but like I would just follow the lead and like push yeah. myself till I died. And I never really got a sense of like, what are my boundaries where you, maybe you could push a little bit more, but you also, you know, New York 2014, I was over the edge at like mile eight where you wouldn't have done that. You would have been like, I'm in shape to run 229. I'm actually not going to go with them right now where I'm like, whatever, go. you know, <laughs> put on the cape, let's go. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. I also like... Did you did you work out with a lot of other females or was it usually like male pace or like did you get into little races and practice all the time? With other females? Yeah. Um, I feel like Shalane and I beat each other to the ground a little bit. Okay. Cause I'm like a I'm like a the first quarter of the workout, I'm barely hanging in there. And I'm like in my head, like, this is way too hard. Then in the middle part, I'm like, oh, I'm okay. And then the last part, I'm like, oh, I got more left. Yeah. And yeah. So I think she would push the beginning and oftentimes I would push the end and it was dumb. Like we were not always, but there were, I can think of specific days where I'm like, yeah. that was so dumb. Um, so, but I felt like I did a better job with the men because it didn't, it wasn't personal. I'm not supposed to beat them. They're men. Right. Yeah. I think that's an interesting thing with training groups where there's times where I'm like, I'm just not racing every day. I don't care. Like I'm not racing you. But it's then you hard. get three quarters of the way through their workout and you're like, you're not going to take my confidence. Like, I'm going to end you. And yeah. You, yeah. But, and then it's like, are you going to have the breakthrough? Are you going to have the breakdown? Right. Right. It's tough. That's why we need coaches to manage it. <laughs> yes. That's why <laughs> there are coaches. Yeah. What about right. you? Would you want to coach? I know you want to wrap this no. up, but now I have to ask no. you. I don't want to coach. It's too much responsibility. I would. Like, At any level? No. Yeah, people's dreams in your hand. God, that's so scary when you put it like that. Yeah, like you work so hard and what if I gave you all the wrong things and then it's just like, oh, no, I've broken you. <laughs> okay, well then, yeah, don't yeah. coach. I'll, I'll get you a contract. No, 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 no. <laughs> I just want to coach high school at some point, that's all. Okay. Yeah, I don't, I I don't want to coach pros. Just kind of what you said, like, and it's just such a commitment. Like, I know what it was like to have a coach that was fully invested and so yeah. – that's what I would want to give. And I there, I just don't, I can't do it. But high school is really appealing to me because I think if you have like this great foundation at the beginning, mm -hmm. you can, it helps you keep the love when things are tough or when, th you know, so that's something I'm interested in, but like not enough to go apply for a job or anything. <laughs> I wouldn't want, like the first time someone said like, I think I have shin splints. I'd be like, I'm done. <laughs> yeah. Be like, ice them and get back out there. Yeah, you got this. <laughs> Terrible coach. Fired. All right. Well, um, I'll look for some high school coaching entries and send you a link so you can apply. Great. And Thanks. You said that you didn't want that, but maybe if the link is on your in your inbox, you'll you'll change your mind. Maybe. And maybe I'll hire you as my agent moving forward. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> We've found our new career paths. This has been productive. Very productive. <laughs> Awesome. Well, thanks for thanks for the chat um, and enjoy your time on the lake. Go catch some fish. Thank you. <laughs> if we catch anything, I'll send you a picture, but I'd probably do. drop it too. Yeah.